El Colegio Mexicano de Otología, Neurootología y Cirugía de Base de Cráneo les da la más cordial bienvenida a nuestra sesión mensual. Les recordamos que sus dudas o comentarios para los profesores las pueden escribir en el área de preguntas y respuestas de la plataforma para que les sean transmitidas al final de la sesión. Esperamos que el tema de este mes sea de su agrado e interés y les ayude al desarrollo de su práctica médica. Gracias por su compañía. Hola, buenas noches a todos. Mi nombre es Benjamín García, soy el presidente actual del Colegio Mexicano de Otología, Neurotología y Cirugía de Base de Cráneo. Les damos la más cordial bienvenida y... Y bueno, deseándoles que este sea un buen año para todos y que tengan salud eh, en este tiempo de pandemia. Y eh, el día de hoy es un, tenemos un ponente eh, de Estados Unidos, una persona que, que tiene un currículum impresionante a pesar de, de, de lo joven que es. La, la doctora que nos va a dar la plática el día de hoy, la doctora Sara Burgin, ella es médico que se graduó de la Universidad de, de Indianápolis, después hizo otorrinolaringología en la Universidad de Michigan, en Ann Arbor, y eh, es profesora de, de la Facultad de Medicina de, de la Universidad de Indiana, Además, eh, ella labora en, eh, en el staff médico de, del hospital Eskenazi de Indianápolis, del cual también es jefa de servicio. Tiene, múltiple, tiene 25 publicaciones en revistas indexadas. Y, y, y bueno, algo para nosotros importante es de que dentro de su currículum, pues también es, ha sido profesora de... de de mis residentes del Centro Médico y Semín nos ha dado algunas pláticas la verdad es que ha sido fabuloso eh, la forma en que nos ha explicado cosas de una forma muy, muy elegante muy, muy bonita entonces para mí es un placer y un agradecimiento a la doctora de que haya a, accedido a, a darnos una plática y pues bueno sin más preámbulos. Muchas gracias, doctora. 
y, y pues empecemos. Yeah, thank you guys very much for hosting me tonight. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak to you. I know I'm surrounded by um, many doctors with much more experience than me. And so I um, appreciate any input you have into to what I've learned and um, look forward to continue to growing in my practice. Okay, can you guys see my slides okay? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, so yeah, so I'm Sarah Bergen and thank you for the lovely introduction. And so tonight I'll be talking about osteoplasty, and we'll go through a couple of cases that I think really show some of the, the challenges and, um, and highlight some of the surgical techniques that I've learned over the years in taking care of these patients. Oh, let's see. So in terms of disclosures, um, I do have some research funding from a company called Biomero Biofire that is not related to this talk. I will be using um, brand names um, for some of the prostheses as well as some of the bone cements, um, but I have no financial relationships to any of those um, products. In terms of our outline for tonight, uh, we'll go over a flow chart, which is how I approach these patients and how I sort of sort them in my mind in terms of surgical planning. We'll review the definition and history of osteoplasty, and then we'll get into sort of the nitty gritty of techniques and cases and looking at a couple uh, different cases and, and then some of the outcomes that we um, are interested in. So this is a flow chart and this is how I organize these patients in my mind. And so this looks like a lot, but we'll come back to it at the end because I do think that this really kind of hits on all the high points when you're uh, evaluating these patients in the clinic. And so I start, you know, we take a patient with conductive hearing loss, and that could be for a lot of reasons. Um, and then the first thing I think about is, is their canal wall intact or not? No matter what else is going on, if their canal wall is intact, or you're going to remove their canal wall, you're very limited in your reconstructive options. And so for those patients, I try to limit them to a single surgery, and I um, take them to plan on a reconstruction with a cartilage cap over the stapes and then laying my reconstructed tympanic membrane onto that graft um, to get us to pediopexy. If their ossicular, uh, if their canal wall is intact, then we look at their ossicular chain. And this is, can be done preoperatively with a CT scan and then confirmed intraoperatively um, with your palpation once you have the middle ear open. So if their ossicular chain is intact, um, then you're sort of going down this um, pathway of where is the mobility limited? If the chain's intact, but with limited mobility, mobility, and it's a stapes fixation, you head to a stapedectomy. If it's the malleus that's fixed, you head to a malleus mobilization procedure or a prosthesis. And these we won't um, discuss too much this evening. We're really going to focus more on the chronic ear portion of this because um, stapedectomy, as you guys know, could be a whole, a whole uh, conference in and of itself. The ossicular chain is not intact, then you need to um, look at defining the defect. And so the hospital where I work is a large trauma center. So we do see a lot of temporal bone fractures and ossicular um, discontinuities, disruptions, and fractures. And my general approach for those patients is that I give them six months. A lot of those ankylose spontaneously, and so those are patients that we generally can delay surgery on. The more interesting ones and where the majority of this talk focuses is on the patients with chronic ear disease and cholesteatoma. And so for them, um, we're going to look at whether they have a small defect of the incus lenticular process and long process, and those are going to generally be reconstructed with cement, or a moderate to large incus erosion or stapes erosion. And those are patients that I stage um, and do a second surgery on with either placement of a prosthesis or um, place an incus interposition at the initial surgery if that's possible. So a little bit of the history of ossicular chain reconstruction and ossiculoplasty. So this was pioneered in the 1950s um, by Wolstein and Zollner. And I think the fact that 70 years later, 
we still have many, many different ways to do the surgery kind of is the clue that we haven't figured it out yet. And there's still a lot of places where there's room for improvement in these surgeries. In the mid fifties, the use of an incus to connect the stapes to the tympanic membrane was described for otosclerosis patients. And that really kind of changed the paradigm in that people realized you could bypass the malleus and even potentially the incus. And really you just needed to have a mobile stapes connected to the tympanic membrane, which is still the paradigm that we use today when reconstructing these patients. A lot of different materials have been tried and it turns out the middle ear can be quite finicky. Um, uh, in terms of mucosal hypertrophy, adhesions, um, development, um, narrowing your aerated space of the middle ear, and in terms of extrusion or reactivity to these. So materials that have been tried include Teflon, silastic, polyethylene, and palavite, which all had high extrusion rates and high mucosal reactivity. Autographs, including incus, bone graft, and cartilage have all been described. And I still do use those things in select patients. Other materials um, that have been tried include incus homographs. So there used to be, you know, uh, banks of radiated incuses, um, porous polyethylene, hydroxyapatite, and titanium, which is the majority of what's used today is hydroxyapatite and titanium because those are the least reactive and the materials that have the best sound transduction properties. And then there are bone cements that can be used in a couple of different ways in the middle ear. And there are two brands available in the United States. Um, one is Hydroset, which comes from Stryker, and the other is Odomimics, which comes from Olympus. And so when we look back again, historically at the tympanoplasty classification, what we're really doing with our ossicular chain reconstructions is type three tympanoplasties. And so those are tympanoplasties that connect a reconstructed tympanic membrane onto a stapes. And that connection uh, is what's gonna give you good sound transduction. So our first case, um, this is, uh, and these are all real patients that I took care of. And so there's uh, the highs and the lows are all included in this talk. So this is a 59 year old patient who presented to the otolaryngology clinic for evaluation of right-sided hearing loss. She had a distant history of a right mastoidectomy she actually had uh, been a physician in Israel before she moved to Indiana. Um, and so none of her prior medical records were available. She thought that her incus had been removed at the time of the prior surgery, but she wasn't quite sure. Uh, she had a left-sided tinnitus and, and a cracking, but no otorrhea. When we looked at her ear, um, her right tympanic membrane was thickened, but it was translucent. There was no effusion and it was mobile. So there was no evidence of any recurrent cholesteatoma or perforation. Um, and also not um, a clear indication of why she had her hearing loss. So obviously we got an audiogram um, and that showed a conductive hearing loss in the right ear, but not as dramatic as I would have expected for a completely absent incus. And so I got a CT scan and we see in her CT scan that the history was misleading. She does in fact have an incus present and she has a very well aerated mastoid and well aerated middle ear. And so I offered her a middle ear exploration um, with a possible osseculoplasty to address what looked to me to be a shortened um, incus long process. And so we used a transcanal approach because her mastoid looked so healthy. And in terms of our intraoperative finding, there was erosion of the long process and lenticular process of the incus. And there was a two millimeter gap between the stapes capitulum and the residual incus. Stapes and malleus were mobile, and there was no um, perforation as expected. And so I chose to reconstruct her because her middle ear was so healthy um, with a tragal cartilage graft that I fashioned as a cap graft, and I placed a two and a half millimeter centered alto partial ossicular reconstruction prosthesis. And we'll go kind of review different prosthesis options in a bit. And she did great. Um, so this is not perfect. She does still have a bit of an air bone gap on the right, uh, particularly at 500 and at 4K, but she was very happy and she couldn't tell the difference between her right and her left ear, which for me, I was satisfied with this result. And so was she. And a few years went by and she had um, some wax in her ear. Um, she went to her primary care doctor and they did a saline irrigation of her ear to clear the wax. 
She tells me that the irrigation was incredibly painful, that she immediately had some bloody odorrhea and she became dizzy during the irrigation. Um, she also says her hearing immediately decreased. And so when she came to see me after this kind of traumatic irrigation, uh, her prosthesis was visible in her ear canal and she had a perforation of her eardrum right over her posterior superior quadrant. And this is what her hearing looked like, kind of back to where she was when I met her. And so we did a revision tympanoplasty. And this time, instead of doing a prosthesis, I put a cartilage graft on. And so what we found when we went back to the OR was a two millimeter posterior superior quadrant perforation and an extruded corp or prosthesis. The same um, ossicular defect was noted, a two millimeter gap. Um, and there's some a couple of mucosal bands where she had been healing. And so I was a little suspicious of her story, uh, you know, that there was this crusting or cerumen in her ear canal. Um, was that actually just cerumen or was there already a perforation or the beginning of an extrusion? Um, hard to know, I wasn't obviously there for her irrigation, um, but it made me a little hesitant to put another foreign material in her ear. And so what I did was this um, cartilage graft where I make a little square of cartilage and I carve a bowl out of the undersurface of it so it sits down onto the stapes capitulum. And then I left the perichondrium attached. So this is her malleus here. And I tucked the perichondrium up under her malleus. And that was what I did as her tympanic membrane reconstruction and as her ossicular chain reconstruction. And so that healed beautifully. And this is what she looked like postoperatively. Again, near complete closure of her air bone gap. She did a little worse at the higher frequencies than she did with her PORP, but she did a little better at the lower frequencies. And so again, not a perfect outcome, but I was satisfied with this. And I like this case because I think it shows a couple important things about osseculoplasty. And one is that there's multiple right ways to reconstruct the ossicular chain. Um, in retrospect, I would not have avoided putting a PORP in her in the first place. I still think that was the right choice for her initial surgery. Um, but I, I also sort of am always a little suspicious of people who extrude their prostheses that don't come up that frequently, um, but they do come up. And it seems that some people's bodies just don't want that foreign material in there. And so if anybody has extruded a prosthesis, I am very hesitant to put a second prosthesis in her. And it shows that she got good outcomes with multiple techniques. Um, it also kind of highlights that complete closure of the air bone gap is not a realistic expectation for these patients. These are patients with diseased middle ears, um, oftentimes alterations of their malleus position. And so I try to set realistic expectations up front with them that we probably won't get it perfect, but we can get it much better than what it is when they present to me. Okay, so that's the first case. The second case, I'm going to um, actually skip over his entire first surgery um, because that was sort of cholesteatoma extirpation and a tympanoplasty. And so we'll start um, where he comes to me for a planned second stage after a cholesteatoma resection. And at that point, I didn't pull his audiogram, but he had a near maximal conductive hearing loss. And so I'm not sure exactly if we have all faculty or, or if we have some trainees in the audience, but I just wanted to include a little bit about cholesteatoma. So as you guys know, it's an epidermal inclusion cyst of the middle ear or the mastoid. It generally starts in the pars flaccida. The majority of them are acquired, but they can also be congenital. And there's a spectrum of chronic ear disease um, going from normal ear to a stage one or milder traction, a stage two um, or severe attraction where we, we begin to see deep pockets that don't clear um, or wrapping around the malleus. Stage three would be our atelectasis. So that's when our tympanic membrane is draped over the um, promontory and middle ear structures, but still mobile with pneumatic otoscopy. Um, these patients are all surgical candidates. Um, the stage four adhesive disease is when we begin to get the tympanic membrane adhering to the middle ear mucosa. And those patients, as long as they aren't draining, I try to avoid operating on um, because I, we often make their hearing worse um, and put them through a big operation to get there. And then the final stage is a cholesteatoma, which is clearly a patient that needs surgery who has infected draining um, retention of keratin debris in their ear. 
And so these are um, pictorial representations of the spectrum of ear disease um, from our normal ear to a retractive eardrum. Clearly this one also has a serous effusion. Our atelectatic ear, you begin to see promontory and stapes, but on our pneumatic otoscopy, that'll lift off. Our adhesive disease, um, these are just really terrible surgeries if you ever decided to undertake one um, because you're really just scraping this thin layer of tissue off of, you know, um, stapedia, stapes, incus, round window, um, and then cholesteatoma, which generally shows up how this picture is with um, an aerated middle ear. You can often have a malleus sort of chronically retracted and then these uh, pars plaster retractions. And so for those patients, I like to do a staged reconstruction. Um, this does a couple things. One, it gives us a chance to ensure that the cholesteatoma is completely cleared before we place our prosthesis. About 10% of these patients have recurrent cholesteatoma. Um, and so this gives you a chance to get back in the ear, make sure that there is no recurrence. Um, if there is small limited recurrence, you can clear it out at that point. Um, the other thing it does is it makes the surgery easier. So you have fewer mobile parts. Um, if you are putting a prosthesis in at the same time as you're reconstructing the eardrum, you often will have a mobile fascia graft if it's a large perforation, a mobile cartilage graft because you need that interpose between your tympanic membrane and your prosthesis, and then your mobile prosthesis. Um, and that, I have trouble um, getting the prosthesis in the exact position I want when there's that many different pieces moving. I'll show you guys in a minute how I like to do these second stages, but I also like it because it allows the tympanic membrane to heal and be stably positioned. And so you don't have this um, kind of chronic retraction of your tympanic membrane that can make your prosthesis be oversized and cause it to shift. I do feel very strongly that preparation of the middle ear during the initial surgery is key to having a successful second stage. And so the things that I do, if I'm planning for a second stage with a reconstruction, I always complete a facial recess when planning a second stage osteoplasty. And that's because I'll do a post-auricular approach and I'll put my prosthesis in through the facial recess. These chronic ears tend to have a medialized malleus. And so I like to lateralize that malleus by dividing the tensor tympani tendon. And I'll show you that in a couple of pictures. We can uh, see where it is pretty clearly. Um, that is nearly impossible to do if the ossicles are intact, but if you have an absent or severely eroded incus, you can very easily reach up the backside of the malleus to divide that tendon. I generally will maintain that lateralization and prevent adhesions by placing a piece of silastic or silicone. And I use a 0.4 millimeter thickness, and I drew a little um, diagram over here of how I create that. So I use a seven millimeter speculum to generally size it, and then I cut out the posterior superior quadrant um, because I don't want it sitting between the incus and the, um, or sorry, between the stapes and the, the tympanic membrane. Um, and then I leave this little prong here. And if there's irritated mucosa or rough raw mu mucosa around the eustachian tube opening, I put that prong down the eustachian tube to help that stay open. And it's not long, a millimeter or two, but it's just enough to open that, um, keep that orifice open. And then I reconstruct the tympanic membrane, um, usually in two layers with a piece of temporalis fascia um, to get our big plane. And then I use a single piece of cartilage in the posterior superior quadrant, and I set that up on the sputum. Um, in my early, early days, um, I uh, tried to have that not touch the bone to have better tympanic membrane mobility. And I felt that I got more shifting of the graft as the healing process um, went on. So now I always set that up on the sputum. And so I have a little video of how I do the second stage. And I apologize if there's sound that goes with this. Um, I'm going to actually mute it. And so this is a second stage going through the posterior incision. That's the piece of silastic that I had placed in there. And I'm using a 45 degree endoscope to assess the middle ear and looking through the facial recess. And so you see that in this patient, there was a small cholesteatoma recurrence. Um, and so we're gonna go ahead with our endoscope and get that out.
And it's a little more challenging than having two hands, but it's still overall fairly quick. And I like this approach because I don't do any canal incisions. And so I don't have a, I have a stable distance between that tympanic membrane and the stapes, which is what I'm measuring here. So I use an instrument to approximate and I'll actually measure that instrument on my surgical field on a little ruler to say, you know, it's two millimeters or it's three millimeters. Here, we're just stopping some bleeding with some epinephrine cotton. And here's our little prosthesis. And in this person, I didn't like where the cartilage was sitting over the graft. So I'm adding a second piece of cartilage. And you take that thickness of the cartilage into account as you're sizing your prosthesis. And so again, this is, has to be one-handed surgery because it's with the endoscope. Um, and so it takes a little bit of practice and is frankly probably easier for those of us who train doing endoscopic sinus surgery. But so we just lift that up so we get a little bit of tension on the um, tympanic membrane and we didn't get it the first time. And then you see that sets onto your stapes, it has just a little bit of tension, so it's not going to wiggle. And that cartilage is sitting well on top of the head of the prosthesis. And so that's a very, very stable reconstruction. We don't need to pack the ear. Um, I generally put one or two little pieces of gel foam around um, the prosthesis and the stapes just to stabilize it. But that's really all we have to do. And so um, choosing a prosthesis, I have a, a little diagram here that kind of highlights the different types of prostheses and when you would choose one over the other. And so the pictures here mostly have hydroxyapatite heads. Um, and this shows a prosthesis that fits under the malleus. Um, and so obviously I'll use a bucket type or a clip type if we have an intact stapes that can attach right onto our stapes superstructure. If we don't have an intact stapes, we just have a foot plate. Um, there are multiple different options. I generally will use um, one with an attached stapes foot plate, um, such as you see here. Um, the foot plate helps divide the pressure and it stabilizes the prosthesis a little bit to keep it from wiggling. And then different types of prostheses. And so um, there are partial ossicular reconstruction prostheses, which most of them have a bell on the end of them, and that's to sit over the stapes capitulum. And there are total ossicular reconstruction prostheses. And most of them have a, a little solid kind of weighted bottom, and that will fit into a foot plate shoe that helps stabilize that on the foot plate. Um, apple bomb prostheses um, can be good if your incus is mostly intact, but not entirely intact. Um, the little basket, portion fits over your shortened incus and kind of acts like rebar. And then you can reinforce that with a bone cement. Now the limit with these is the, the height. Um, you can't get them shorter than about two millimeters. And so when I have someone with a very narrow middle ear space, who I think does need a prosthesis, um, the Frisbee prosthesis is the best answer for that. So you see that the head that sits on the cartilage is not much, um, bigger than the little bell. And you can get those anywhere from one, one, one and a half up to two millimeters. An alternative to a prosthesis, which I think is a great alternative when you have the bone available is an incus interposition. Um, there are, these are not my pictures because um, I did not have a picture of my own incus interposition. Um, and I, I don't do it exactly like this. I'll generally um, drill a groove on one side uh, for the malleus, and on the opposite side, I drill a little hole for the stapes head. And in that way, I set the incus interposition in there. So how do we decide who needs a prosthesis and who needs an incus and who should just get a hearing aid or a Baja? And so um, the guidelines that I kind of use, if it's more than a 20 to 25 decibels, uh, hearing loss, it's consistent with an ossicular discontinuity. And those are patients who are likely to get improvement with a prosthesis or reconstruction. If they have a canal wall down cavity, it's often unsatisfactory hearing improvement. And so that's why on that initial algorithm I showed, those patients I do not take for a second surgery to do the reconstruction. I just do it right there in the first place. 
and whatever they get is what they get. And if they still need um, additional hearing rehab, those are patients that I would offer a bone conduction hearing aid or amplification to. Always be careful in patients um, whose air bone gap is less than 30 decibels because even a small hearing loss could cause a functional problem if you drop those down. When the bone thresholds are greater than 30 decibels, um, I don't think those patients are bad candidates for this, but I do counsel them that they will not have normal hearing and that they're likely to still need amplification even if surgery goes well and, and we get improvements in their hearing. However, little, uh, little improvements in their air bone gap can decrease their amplification requirements and make them more satisfied hearing aid users with less feedback and uh, need for less powerful devices. So I would still offer those patient surgery. Um, improvement of the poor hearing ear to within 15 decibels of the good ear can improve binaural hearing. And with your binaural hearing, you do get an additional kind of five to seven decibels um, just from hearing things in both ears. And so I think if you can get them within that range, those patients generally tend to be very happy. So if you look at the research studies for this, which we're not gonna go through, um, the air bone gap of less than 20 decibels is generally considered a successful surgery. For patients getting a partial reconstruction prosthesis, about 80% are within that 20 decibels. So about 80% are considered successful surgeries. For patients with an absent stapy superstructure who require a total ossicular reconstruction prosthesis, only about 20% um, are considered successful and get closure to less than 20 decibels. Okay, case three. So this was a 54 year old woman um, who was noted to have incus erosion during a transcanal tympanoplasty with limited cholesteatoma. She did not have a mastoidectomy. And so this is a picture of uh, her ear intraoperatively. It's the left ear. And so you can see we have a facial nerve here. Her tensor tympani tendon is here. Uh, this is her stapes, which isn't perfectly clear, and then her incus. And you can see her incus is kind of thinned and not super healthy. We have a little defect here. And then actually her lenticular process, a bit of it is still attached to the stapes. And so in my mind, this is a perfect patient for repair with otomimics. And so how do I do that? Um, there's two different brands of sort of bone cement that are approved for use in the middle ear, Otomimics and Hydroset. My hospital stocks Otomimics um, because the orthopedic surgeons like Mimics. And so that's what I use because we get a deal on it. Um, but in terms of the surgical technique, it's really important to clear the residual mucosa and ensure hemostasis. And so I'll use a laser for this. Um, I usually use a CO2 laser um, and I use the um, Omni guide, so it's a little fiber laser rather than the micro manipulator off of the um, microscope. And I'll clear residual mucosa um, off of the incus and stapes so that I have clean, dry bone. And you want to make sure you have very good hemostasis because if you have liquids or bloods getting into your mimics while it's curing, it won't cure properly and you can get cracking. And so I make sure the middle ear is perfect and dry, and I'll sometimes even take um, some dry cotton and dab any moisture that's in there. Um, and then I create my active mixture, um, which is made by um, sort of mixing this liquid with this powder. And I mix it on the side table until I get uh, what I call a sticky liquid. It is still liquid, and you can, but you can kind of string it out a bit. Um, once it's at that point, I use just a tiny drop, and I'll put it on the stapes head, and then kind of drag it over to the incus. Um, at that same time, I'll have my surgical assistant make several little balls so we can check the cure outside. Um, we then keep a suction in the middle ear to ensure there's airflow um, and drying. And we wait for seven whole minutes, which is like the most boring seven minutes that ever happens in surgery. Um, just sitting waiting and I usually make the resident hold the suction during that time uh, so that I can socialize. And so this is a, a picture of how we do it. You just set the um, hydroxyapatite on top of the stabies, drag it up to the incus, and then wait for it to cure. And this works really, really well. And so this is a, the audiogram of the patient whose photo I showed you. 
And you can see they have essentially a complete closure of their air bone gap. A little bit of a gap here at um, 250, but they also have that in their non-operated um, right ear. So I didn't worry about that too much. Okay, so case four is our last case. So this is a 51 year old woman. And this actually, I saw this patient in clinic today. Um, she has chronic otomastoiditis and she underwent uh, the surgery I described to you earlier, a staged tympanoplasty and ossicular reconstruction with a titanium prosthesis and a cartilage graft. Her hearing was then improved for several years after her osteoplasty. She came back today conveniently um, with a throbbing pain in her ear. Um, and when I looked in her ear, we saw this. And so what we're looking at here, this is her right ear. This is her malleus. Um, this is her cartilage gap graft that I had placed previously. And this was just a little bit of crusting um, in front of the cartilage graft. And you can see where the graft, when I initially put it in, was level with the malleus. Over time, it has sunk back a bit. Um, and, and when I tried to remove this crusting, it was exquisitely tender for her. And we put some liquids on it. We could not get that clean. So we got a CT scan. Um, and so what this shows is her titanium prosthesis that I had previously placed. We didn't get the stapes in this shot. Unfortunately, it's canted a little bit, um, but you see her thickened tympanic membrane and it's just sitting exposed to the ear canal. And so that's what's under that crust is this graft. And so uh, the extrusions don't happen commonly, particularly not with titanium. Um, when I have had them happen, it's almost always this situation where I have not interposed it under the malleus. And due to ongoing chronic ear disease, they get this kind of retraction and the, a little bit of the prosthesis peeks its head out from under the uh, graft. So generally, if there was an acute infection, there's not in this patient, I would recommend letting that acute infection heal, um, allow the graft to fully extrude. And then if and when she wants to have this replaced, I would replace this with a homograph material. So she's somebody that um, if she wants to have a reconstruction, and I think she will, I would put either um, a cartilage, cartilage graft in here or an incus. She has a little bit of incus body, but I'm not sure if it's enough for an interposition. So this was timely because uh, I mentioned some of the things I think led to her extrusion. How can we present, prevent it? One, um, we wanna ensure that her cartilage cap covers the entire prosthesis, uh, but be aware that the graft can shift over time. Um, insinuate the prosthesis under the malleus and use a prosthesis with a mobile head. So this is a new prosthesis that I haven't actually gotten a chance to try yet other than in the lab, but I'm very excited about it. And so it has kind of all the features that I've been looking for in a prosthesis. It has a groove here um, so that we can insinuate it under the malleus so that if the malleus does shift, the, the prosthesis shifts with it. And then you can't tell here, but there's a little silicone ring between the stem and the head of the prosthesis. And so that allows the head to shift in relation to the stem so that we can still get an ideal angle, um, you know, the, the angle of the stapes is really what determines where the head sits. Um, and sometimes the problem is that the angle of the stapes and the angle of the tympanic membrane aren't at a right angle to each other. And the prosthesis is always at a right angle. So the fact that this one shifts, something I'm really excited to use. If we have a torque, we wanna to use a foot plate shoe to minimize um, any movement. And then I can't emphasize this enough is monitoring the patients for a long time. Um, you know, both of these patients, the patient I just presented had her initial surgery with me in 2017, so five years ago, and still is having problems or was fine and now is having problems again. And so um, when I was first starting out in practice, I, I had a much uh, longer leash for these patients. And now I really like to keep them close and check on them um, so that if they are starting to retract, they can put an ear tube in or do something to, to prevent kind of a disastrous extrusion like this poor lady had. And so um, we are to the end of my slides, um, but I wanted to put this up again as a summary. And so we spent most of our time talking about these patients and my surgical techniques um, for reconstructing these patients' ears. Um, and then a little bit of time talking about this one. But if you have questions about any of these things, I'm happy to take those.
Hola, buenas noches. Eh, quiero presentarles a los moderadores que participarán a, en esta discusión. Tenemos al doctor eh, López Cisniega, que está en, en Chihuahua, el doctor Gabriel Paz, que está en la, en la ciudad de Guadalajara, y el doctor Juan Carlos Cisneros, que está en la Ciudad de México. Eh, los tres son grandes otólogos, muy reconocidos. Y también tenemos al doctor Raimundo Munguía, amigo de la doctora Burgin. De hecho, a través de ella fue que, que conocimos a la doctora. El doctor Raimundo Munguía es otorrinolaringólogo del egresado de la Universidad Autónoma del Estado de México, que posteriormente se fue a hacer la, la residencia de otorrino a, a Canadá. Hizo una maestría, un doctorado y ahora está eh, trabajando en la Universidad de Purdue. Y desde hace, creo que ya, ya hasta perdí la cuenta, pero creo que llevamos como, este es el cuarto año donde hemos, eh, gracias a la tecnología del Zoom, eh, los viernes nos da un curso a, a todos, a los residentes. Y, y de ahí es donde ha participado la doctora Burgi. Y pues muy agradecido que estés aquí, Raimundo. Y, y pues bueno, este, pues em, empecemos esta, esta discusión. Eh, ¿Te cedemos la palabra, Juan Carlos? Juan Carlos. <ríe> bueno. No, es que... Es... Estaba todavía ocupado cinco minutos sí, pidió. no te preocupes. Si quieres empezar, eh, puedes empezar tú, Raimundo, si gustas. Muchas gracias, mi estimado Benjamín. Y más que nada, um, agradecerles a, a ti y a, a lo que fue el, el CELICEMI, la Universidad Autónoma del Estado de México, esta colaboración que mencionas que hemos tenido. Uh, orgullosamente, yo soy graduado de allá. Y por muchas razones logramos emigrar. Y bueno, and thank you very much, Sara. Really, really appreciate the that you decided to participate with us today, that you are actually with us uh, for classes, for lectures with my students. Um, les comento que eh, eh, llevamos efectivamente cuatro años con el, eh, el ICEMIN y a través de la Universidad Autónoma, teniendo estos cursos todos los viernes, en que tratamos de torturar un poquito a los residentes, ¿verdad? Con un poquito de, 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 de otología y neurotología. Eh, es un curso que yo, yo doy como profesor aquí de, de cátedra en la Universidad Purdue y también como mencionó el doctor Benjamín, para los que no me conocen, también soy este profesor de, de, la, de la Universidad de Indiana, de la Escuela de Medicina de la Universidad de Indiana y es a través de esto, de unos cursos donde conocí a la, a la doctora Sarah Bergen. Uh, we met um, about uh, around three years ago or so, taking a course together. We got to chat a little bit and uh, I just invite her and like, hey, why don't you share with us, with my students, a few of your experiences. And she was eager. She was always happy to participate. We got the residents from Isamin involved. I think that they, uh, uh, they enjoy this very much too. And a little uh, commercial TV ad. She's participating with us in a couple of weeks, if I'm not mistaken, or next week again. Mm -hmm. So all you are uh, invited. Um, por favor, si quieren participar en estas pláticas de los viernes, mándenme un correo. Ahora, como dice el doctor Benjamín, con la tecnología es muy fácil a través del Zoom, ¿verdad? Y eh, los podemos este, invitar y participar y tratamos de tener un poquito de diversión en, cuando presentamos casos clínicos y demás. Um, once again, just uh, acknowledge and say thank you, Sarah, for participating, Dr. Bergen. And uh, no sé si tengan algunas otras preguntas, algunos otros comentarios. Uh, Aquí estamos. Gracias. Gabriel, si quieres eh, empezar. Sí, sí, claro. Eh, doctora Sara Burgin, mucho gusto y gracias por la, la participación y, y la excelente eh, eh, ponencia donde lo hace ver muy claro y, y, y bonitos videos en relación a, a los procedimientos quirúrgicos, sobre todo endoscópicos. Eh, bueno, eh, yo quiero preguntarle eh, si ha tenido algún caso donde haya tenido que, que aparte de, de hacer la reconstrucción no solamente eh, osicular uh, por una afección al yunque, 
y o, a, a, al martillo, sino que también hubiese tenido en conjunto una fijación de la platina, donde tuviese que echar mano de alguna, eh, un procedimiento donde haga una maleolo vestíbulo pexia. No sé si ha tenido la oportunidad de, de llevarlo a cabo. I have not had to do that. Um, I have had, I had to do one type four tympanoplasty where there was cholesteatoma draped over the edges of the foot plate and I couldn't get it all off or didn't feel like I could safely get it all off. And so in that case, I exteriorized the foot plate, um, but I have not had to um, graft from the foot plate to the malleus directly. Usually in those cases, I've had malleus erosion. Usually I just bypass the malleus and go straight to the tympanic membrane. Yeah. Muy bien. Esto es porque algunos pacientes no solamente cursan con, en, en, en inflamación crónica con afección al yunque o, 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 o a las demás estructuras, sino también pueden lle llevar a cabo o en conjunto a lo mejor una patología de autoesclerosis también. Pueden coexistir las dos enfermedades eh, y en estos casos eh, tenemos que hacer una apertura de la platina y reestructurar o comunicar a través de alguna prótesis o eh, la, la vibración desde un injerto timpánico que reconstru reconstruyamos. Pero muy bien, gracias. Este, eh, ¿Algo más? Doctor López Cisnega. Uh, sí, uh, buenas noches, ¿sí ¿me escuchan? Sí, ¿Sí? perfecto. Uh, sí, muy buenas noches. Uh, pues, primeramente, felicitar a la doctora por su excelente exposición. Eh, muy interesante eh, lo de las prótesis. Uh, con los que somos un poco ya de más edad, uh, crecimos con las prótesis de, de fluoroplastic de, del doctor Chi, ¿verdad? La Porpi y la Torpi. Y ahora con el, estas uh, prótesis nuevas de, de las, de las uh, casas comerciales, como Curs, como Grace, pues... Uh, son algo muy nuevas para nosotros. Y ya, yo le quería preguntar a la doctora que eh, tenemos en nuestro país una gran cantidad de pacientes con la con eh, mastectomía eh, radical o radical modificada, eh, donde se requiere, eh, además de la reconstrucción de cadena, eh, la reconstrucción de la pared, ¿verdad? De, de, me refiero a la reconstrucción del paciente que, que, que ya con colesteatoma, que tiene varios años que no tiene colesteatoma, eh, eh, se reconstruye eh, la cavidad. Yo estoy tratando de reconstruir cavidades, inclusive mías, de pacientes que operé hace años. Eh, yo quisiera preguntarle, eh, a, además de la reconstrucción de, de la cadena, yo he tenido problemas para reconstruir la pared posterior. ¿sí? ¿Qué es lo que están utilizando ellos para reconstruir la pared posterior en cavidades, en cavidades eh, en, bueno, con muro bajo? ¿verdad? Eh, y me queda muy claro que, que utilizan las, las prótesis nuevas, eso no, es, está completamente claro. Pero, ¿y qué tan frecuente están también haciendo de reconstruir cavidades abiertas con muro bajo? Mi pregunta. No sé si, si, si hay un traductor yeah. que le pueda hacer. So, in, uh, very infrequently. So, my partner um, did his training at Iowa, um, which is kind of the, the mecca for canal wall reconstruction. Um, but even he only does it in the primary setting. He doesn't take a patient who has a, a healed cavity and go back and reconstruct it. Um, even he has started to shy away from those primary reconstructions. Um, you know, what they talk about at the superior cut, if you're going to take the, the wall out, is they do a compound miter cut. So it's supposed to fit together perfectly like a puzzle piece. But he's had a couple of recurrences within that um, compound miter cut um, right at the scutum um, where it should be fitting together and there's a little defect. And so even he, who has always been very enthusiastic about canal wall reconstruction, Um, is starting to back away from it. I have not done any in a delayed fashion, only primary at the time of their initial surgery, um, taking the wall out for access and then putting that same piece of bone back in. Ok, sí, sí realmente es, es infrecuente entonces que la hagan, pero aquí en nuestro país tenemos muchos pacientes con a, con a muro bajo, con, con a, cavidades amplias, ¿verdad? And so are you... 
are you wanting to reconstruct them for hearing reasons or so that the cavity doesn't have to be cleaned? Eh, no, por razones de audición, para que mejore su audición también. Sí, yeah. mejore su audición y para que igual. Para patients, um, I've started, there's a, a new bone conduction device that's really, really good. The, it's called the cochlear ossea. And so it has, um, it's a, the implant is about the size of a cochlear implant and it has a piezoelectric unit. So all the sound producing mechanism is under the skin. And then there's a magnet and uh, there's an external piece that attaches by a magnet. It's all transcutaneous, nothing percutaneous. So you don't have to deal with an abutment or infection. So those patients, I generally tell them, that's the way we do hearing rehab and you just have a bowl that has to get clean. I really worry about recurrence or something being hidden in those bowls that have been healed a long time with the you know subdermal tissues healed into the bone. Okay. Uh, otra pregunta que le quería hacer es uh, eh, el paciente que tiene una perforación timpánica que realmente ya es un oído que no está drenando, que está seco. Eh, 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 usted dice que la que, que puede hacer una estadística, que la eh, lo puede operar posteriormente. Uh, aquí hay uh, hay controversia porque muchos pacientes, uh, uh, bueno, muchos médicos operan pacientes uh, y tratan de, ser, de sellar ese oído, hacer una timpanoplastía y en ese mismo momento hacer la osiculoplastía. Usted eh, recomienda, sigue recomendando que se haga en un segundo estadio, primero sellar ese oído que se logre el injerto y después lo hacerlo en un segundo tiempo o hacerlo en ese mismo tiempo. Creo que hay, hay controversia, hay médicos que hacen eh, ambas cosas. Me gustaría saber su opinión. En, me, me refiero al paciente sin colesteatoma, me refiero al, paci me refiero al paciente que nomás eh, presenta una otitis media crónica con perforación timpánica que, que requiere una, una timpano, eh, timpanoplastia tipo, tipo 1, una meningoplastia. Así me explique. Sí, muy claro. Yeah, so for those patients, it depends what type of reconstruction I'm going to do, whether I would do it as a single stage or a multiple stage. If it was going to be a hydroxyapatite or an incus interposition, I would do that as a single stage during the tympanoplasty without any hesitation. The patients where I'm gonna put the um, prosthesis up against the tympanic membrane are the ones where I have some hesitation. For those, I think it depends where their perforation is. If I'm trying to reconstruct a posterior superior perforation at the same time as I have a graft sitting, I find that I have trouble in my hands getting the prosthesis to sit at the exact right angle while moving a piece of cartilage and a tympanomedial flap over it. But if it's an anterior inferior perforation and I can get the graft in and, and it sits nicely and then lay everything back down on top of a prosthesis, those patients I would consider doing as a single stage. Perfecto, sí, muchas gracias. Um, y la otra, otro comentario que nos pregunta es eh, acerca de la, la otitis media adhesiva. Eh, este, yo también en, en lo particular, eh, los estadios 4 eh, y algunos estadios 3, realmente ya no hago nada. El paciente prefiero no tocarlo este, por la posibilidad de tener una cortipatía o la, tratar de movilizar la cadena. Eh, eh, mi pregunta sería eh, ahí a, en, a, si ustedes lo están haciendo junto a algunos pacientes junto con ello están haciendo a, a, de, también cirugía de, de, a, de trompa eustaquio, bueno me refiero al balón de trompa eustaquio, si les puede ayudar y, a, y hacer, hacer junto con ello la, la, la osiculoplastía y, y hacerla agregar la, a, bueno pues mejorar la, la titen media adhesiva <coughs> Yeah, um, so there's a lot. Um, so I am doing eustachian tube balloon dilations and I have done them concurrently with tympanoplasties. There's really not, as I'm sure you know, there's no good data for whether that's helpful or not. Um, but I do it because I think in those patients with the terrible ears, we need to do everything we can to give them every advantage. Um, I agree with you for the adhesive disease, I also do not operate on them. Um, the one exception, I've had a couple patients that have very limited adhesions, just uh, TM sitting on incus and have um, a perforation somewhere else in their tympanic membrane, and they have drainage because of that. Those patients, I have been 
I have taken to surgery with the main goal being to stop the draining ear and a secondary goal being to lyse those adhesions and give them um, a, a normally aerated middle ear. Um, I, I would agree with you that if it's a non-draining ear with adhesive disease, I do not touch those. Um, the eustachian tube balloon, it dilates the eustachian tube, but it doesn't insufflate anything into the middle ear. And so it wouldn't do anything to break up those adhesions. Um, and so I wouldn't use it for adhesive disease, but retractions, um, or if I think people are gonna have ongoing eustachian tube dysfunction, I would use it. Okay, uh, nos están preguntando aquí uh, eh, eh, que en su opinión, ¿cuál es el estado actual del plastipor para reconstrucción circular? Eh, y en cuanto al costo de la prótesis de titanio, bueno, eso sería en México. Uh, más que todo sería que nos preguntan si um, eh, un, una pregunta una, un médico, el doctor Caje llama, eh, en cuanto a, las, uh, a la reconstrucción circular con el plástico. Sí. Medpor también. Plastipor y Medpor. Yeah. So um, I learned as a resident from our plastic surgeons um, that homogenous tissue is always better than um, any foreign material. And so anytime we can do an adequate reconstruction with the patient's own autogenous tissue, that's always my preference. Um, sometimes you can't, sometimes you don't have the right thing or the right shape. And, and so, um, and I will say in the US, people have really moved away from incus interpositions um, because of the time spent carving the graft and how expensive operating room time is here. Um, they say it's much cheaper to just buy a, gra buy a prosthesis than it is to spend 15 minutes, you know, sculpting a graft. Um, and so in terms of what type of material to use for the middle ear prostheses, um, my go-tos have been titanium and hydroxyapatite. And I like the titanium um, because the grace implants, uh, the ones I showed pictures of, are adjustable. And so that's really a logistic thing. They're not super reactive to the ear, but it also means I don't have to keep a billion different sizes. I can have one porp and one twerp, and that's all the hospital has to stock. The curves prostheses are similar in that they're adjustable sizes just like that. Um, but I think just the, the logistics of not having to keep so many things on hand. Plastipore I've not used. I understand you can trim it and adjust it um, if you needed to. Um, and the hydroxyapatite ones that I'm using generally have just a hydroxyapatite head and still an adjustable titanium stem. Um, Le dejo la palabra a otro de los coordinadores, uh, um, Benjamín. Eso. Con, con, completando ahí, doctor López Cisniega, la duda del doctor Cajellama que, que hacía ahí, solo como información, pues una prótesis de Medport tiene un costo aproximado de $3,000 a $3,500 en TORP. Eh, sí, como comentaba la, la doctora, tienen más riesgo de esto de, de, de extrusión. Las prótesis mixtas que eh, manejan algunas casas comerciales y que tienen titanio e hidroxiapatita tienen un costo como de 7,500 pesos. Y las prótesis que son puramente titanio universales, por ejemplo, las CURVS, llegan hasta 11,000 pesos. Entonces, sí, sí son un poquito más, más caras, respondiendo ahí a la duda del doctor Cajellama. Eh, doctor Gabriel Paz, ¿alguna pregunta? Sí, bueno, eh, gracias, doctora. Este, quiero preguntarle, en su actividad eh, quirúrgica, eh, predominantemente lleva a cabo los procedimientos ya sea endoscópicos o con microscopio. ¿Cómo le es más cómodo para usted? ¿Qué es lo que prefiere? O yeah, so I do the majority of my surgery with the microscope because that's how I was trained. Um, I do think having two hands, a hand to suction or retract is incredibly convenient. Um, I give our residents a whole talk about endoscopic sinus surgery. And so the times that I find the endoscope useful is to get into areas that we can't access well with the microscope. So I'll often use it to get up into the epitympanum anteriorly there around intact ossicles. Um, and I'll often use it to look back into the facial recess, usually to confirm that I don't need to do a facial recess. I tend to not do it if I think there's disease there that needs to cl be cleaned out. If I think there's disease that needs to be cleaned out, I'll drill the facial recess and clean it out that way. 
Um, also, usually those patients just have bad disease and they need to be opened up. Um, and then I like it, as I showed, for the endoscopic osciculoplasty for the reason that you don't have to disrupt your well-healed eardrum. Um, I have a partner who uses them in, entirely for his pediatric tympanoplasties because he says, you know, every kid needs a postauricular approach, but if I can do it with the endoscope, I can do it transcanal. Um, and I'll tell you, he has beautiful visualization and he just to keep his skills up though, does everything. He does ear tubes with the endoscope. He does it all with the endoscope. Um, I have not swung that way yet, but I do find it as a helpful adjunct to the microscope and more traditional techniques. Bueno, muy bien. Gracias, Juan Carlos. Doctor Paz, eh, estimado Benjamín, aprovechando que está el doctor Raimundo Munguía, eh, a quien también lo tenemos eh, desde Iowa y, y, y eh, muy contentos de que esté también con nosotros, doctor Raimundo Munguía, moderando aquí para platicar con la doctora Burkin. Eh, ¿Alguna pregunta o algún comentario que tenga para ella? No, efectivamente, gracias Juan Carlos y, y gracias por los comentarios. De hecho es Indiana, no Iowa, pero bueno, está bien. No. <risa> Pero no, al contrario, con la, cuando tengo algunos casos y eso todo, lo, siempre les digo a mis pacientes o les digo a mis estudiantes, allá en Indianápolis, porque como tú sabrás, estoy, en la, estoy como a 45 minutos de Indianápolis como tal, en West Lafayette, entonces siempre les digo, no es que haya una autóloga muy buena allá en Indianápolis y allá te pueden dar toda la, los casos se los refiero a ella porque ella es, sé que ella es la, la jefa. Entonces ella sabe que... Um, yo le agradezco muchísimo Thank cuando you. ella quiere participar con nosotros y que uh, ha sido muy, muy buena, no solo colega, pero también este, amiga personal. Y la verdad, este, mis respetos, todos, todos mis respetos. Siempre yo les digo, no, es que ya está la autóloga, la día de veras. Aquí nada más yo los veo, pero ya está la día de veras. Entonces. <risa> Perfecto, doctor Munguía. Doctor Gabriel Paz, tiene otra pregunta. Sí, este, abusando y gracias, doctora Burgin. Eh, ¿Algún procedimiento que usted haya realizado eh, con anestesia local y sedación eh, en timpanoplastia y o reconstrucción por práctica o por querer saber el resultado inmediato de la audición, en fin? ¿Lo ha llevado a cabo o no? Um. So the question is about local anesthesia for this procedure. So I've done stapedectomy under a local anesthetic, but I've not done my OCRs because I don't trust these patients' ears. You never know when you're going to get in there and there will be cholesteatoma or scar tissue or some kind of mess. But, but stapes, um, I routinely do under a local anesthetic. Um, you, this group will appreciate this. The hospital where I practice has a large portion of patients that don't speak English. And so one of my criteria is if the patient's awake, I have to be able to talk to them directly, not through an interpreter. Um, and so I don't do as many now as what I used to, um, but um, stapes are great, great awake. And I've done um, sort of limited tympanoplasties um, with either a fat graft or a little, uh, what I call butterfly cartilage, where you kind of split the cartilage so it splays and you can tuck it in. Um, so I do those awake. Um, nothing, nothing more involved than that, though. Excelente. Eh, doctora Burkin, oh, muchos cirujanos eh, han cambiado cada vez más la, la técnica hacia usar más y más y más y más cartílago, a pesar de que la capacidad vibrátil del mismo no es la misma que la de la fascia o el pericondrio. Eh, sin embargo, los resultados a largo plazo son, son mucho mejores, eh, creemos todos. Eh, en su práctica también esta, esta es la misma, la misma ocurrencia, sin contar que cuando uno coloca una prótesis de titanio, una porpo, una torp, tratamos de poner algo de cartílago encima. Pero en general, para cerrar el tímpano, ¿usted también utiliza de manera preferencial cartílago? Not always. Um, so if I have somebody who has a non-graining ear, it's been clean and not infected, um, who, who has a clear reason for their perforation. They got hit in the ear, 
or they had a tube when they were six years old and now they're 25, those patients I'll primarily reconstruct with temporalis. And I have good outcomes with that. Um, and even, you know, some of the, the kids that come in with perforations, I just tuck a little piece of fat in there. It's a minimal procedure, not even really a tympanoplasty. Um, anybody that I'm doing a secondary tympanoplasty on who's already failed once, those patients always get cartilage in my hands because um, I do think they need the stiffness to resist some um, retraction. And if I'm really worried about them, I'll put a tube in at the time of the primary surgery right in between cartilage. Um, I almost never put cartilage in the anterior superior quadrant because I think getting the 3D geometry of that just right is challenging. And I've gotten it so that my, my fascia graphs always sit right. And so I just don't wanna mess with something that works, um, but I will frequently put it inferiorly and posteriorly if it's a revision case. Y, y en estas situaciones, eh, gusta más del uso de underlay, inlay o overlay como técnica quirúrgica. Yeah, um, almost always an underlay. Um, and so I will leave a little perichondrium on the cartilage um, and then I'll put fascia as well because I do think that the fascia molds to the native tympanic membrane a little bit better. So I'll do two layers. I thin the cartilage though. And I actually, um, there's a Kurz knife, um, which will flatten the cartilage and cut it, which is really nice, but I usually do it by hand. And, and so I just get a really sharp scalpel and I trim it by hand so that I can sort of go with the flow of where all the curvature in the um, cartilage is. It also gives the residents a couple minutes without me looking over their shoulder while I prepare the graphs. Um, and so I always thin the cartilage before I put it in. I almost never use full thickness unless it's somebody really old with atrophic cartilages. Perfect. Um, como otra pregunta nada más, doctor, aprovechando um, tenerla con nosotros, en todos los casos de perforación timpánica, ¿hace usted tomografía antes de entrar a, a cirugía o a veces con la brecha aérea o ósea en audiometría ya sabe más o menos qué va a esperar y no requiere de tomografía antes de hacer una timpanoplastía o una tímpanociculoplastía? Y por otro lado, además de la tomografía, ¿entra siempre preparada con diferentes tipos de prótesis o eh, dependiendo lo que vea en tomografía es que escoge la prótesis para utilizar? Yeah, so to answer the second part, we always keep all the prostheses in stock in the hospital. And so that's very convenient. Um, what we don't, we don't own the exact type of laser that I like. Um, so if I do think I'm gonna have, I prefer to clear the stapes off the laser rather than by hand. Um, I think the patients have less dizziness and it's less risk of any avulsion. Thank God I've never had that happen, um, but I worry about it and so, Um, if I think I'm going to have to do a lot of clearing off of the stapes, I'll have a laser available. Um, I do not get a CT in every case. If it is somebody with a clean, dry perforation that I can see all the edges of and I can see their middle ear and, I, and their audiogram is consistent with just a perforation and not an ossicular problem, I do not get a CT scan for all those patients. But similarly, I don't get a CT scan for every stapes patient either. If they have a perfect exam and their acoustic reflexes are absent, um, I, don't, I don't scan those patients. And I think that's just how I was, I was trained by a very old surgeon <laughs> and he didn't get CTs. And so um, I don't think you have to if the exam is really reassuring. Now, that being said, if they have drainage, I scan all of them because I want to determine whether they need a mastoidectomy or not. Muchas gracias, doctora. You're welcome. Juan Carlos, y ahí te podría agregar, y al contrario de, de la doctora Borgen, uh, a nosotros nos enseñaron que todos les tomamos tomografía. Sea el paciente que el caso que sea, le tomas tomografía para prevenir cualquier complicación. O al menos esa fue la explicación que me dieron a mí como, como estudiante. <risa> Excelente, Raymond. Creo que esa es una, una, una situación que, que es un tanto debatible, ¿no? A veces, como dice la doctora Working, si vemos una eh, audiometría que es muy franca para una perforación simple, una brecha pequeña, tal vez de menos de 20 decibeles, eh, 
podríamos entrar simplemente a cerrar perforación y para los residentes que escuchan el, 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 el tener brechas mayores, tal vez de 35, 40 decibeles, sin duda casi siempre implican algo de lisis de la cadena ocicular y la tomografía puede ser útil. Entonces, eh, creo, creo que de acuerdo con, con, con ambos comentarios y es, es, es eh, una gran ventaja que puedan ustedes entrar a quirófano teniendo diversos tipos de prótesis a la mano. A veces uno tiene que adivinar qué usar o a veces utilizar recursos como tomar algo de cartílago para reconstruir o si tenemos algún cemento óseo y es ideal tener diferentes tipos de prótesis. Eh, estimado Benjamín, no sé si hay algún otro comentario. Doctor López Cisniega. Sí. Yo, yo siempre he pensado que la cirugía de osiculoplastía es fascinante porque es como una caja de Pandora. Como bien lo dice la doctora, tú abres el oído y de pronto te puedes encontrar muchas cosas. Y ahí es donde viene el ingenio como cirujano que, que uno tiene que resolver el problema. La realidad es de que yo lo que he tenido como experiencia es de que las prótesis me han funcionado muy bien cuando es una disrupción de cadena por traumatismo, porque es un paciente que no tiene ningún proceso infeccioso o, o probablemente atelectasias o cosas de ese tipo. Cuando son pacientes que tienen muchos problemas de, o, de, o antecedentes de infecciones recurrentes, me ha pasado que, que me ha ido mejor cuando les pongo cosas autólogas al paciente, ¿no? Ya sea el eh, hueso, ya sea cartílago, y, y, y bueno, como bien lo dice Juan Carlos, la realidad es de que desafortunadamente, bueno, ustedes bien lo saben que en México no tenemos todas las cosas que a lo mejor la doctora Sara tiene allá en Estados Unidos, y a veces tenemos que emplear el ingenio para resolver el problema, pero es una cosa que nos ha fascinado, creo yo, y, y pues ese sería mi comentario. En, en, Muy bien. En resultado, eh, doctora Burkin también, eh, doctor López Cisniega, Gabriel, si ustedes tuvieran un yunque completito, lo sacaron, está perfecto, lo pueden remodelar perfectamente y tienen una porp de titanio eh, para hacer una interposición, digamos, entre martillo y estribo, ¿cuál sería su primera elección? Bueno, voy a, a contestar. Bueno, si, si tienes la posibilidad de tener la prótesis, en definitiva, eh, por, eh, en mis manos eh, funciona mejor colocar la prótesis, tanto porque es más, eh, más fácil y el resultado audiológico lo, lo he evidenciado. Cuando hago transposición de yunque, el resultado audiológico es aceptable. Cierras probablemente a casi 20 decibeles o 15. En cambio, con, con una prótesis puedes cerrar a, hasta 10 decibeles la brecha. Y eh, a futuro el, el, es más estable el resultado biológico con la prótesis que con la transposición, que a lo mejor al cabo de unos años puede disminuir, haber adherencias o, o un poquito más de, de problemas. Esto lo he visto en mi práctica con varios, comparando una técnica u otra. Pero bueno, si no hay prótesis, pues bueno, con lo que, con lo que haya es lo que se hace, como, como dice Benjamín correctamente. Sí, a no sé, Sí, uh, yo, yo, uh, lo particular, uh, yo prefiero la prótesis. Eh, en mis manos eh, pienso que la prótesis, bueno, la prótesis para mí es, da mucho mejor resultado que, que uh, ponerse uno ahí en el, en el quirófano a, a tratar de modelar ahí el, 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 el huesecillo. Eh, pienso que se debe utilizar la tecnología. Eh, las prótesis ya pasaron por, por todo lo, a, lo que es el proceso de de la ingeniería biomédica y, y si, estamos, si está disponible la prótesis, pues adelante. Ahora, si no está disponible la prótesis, pues claro que, que tenemos que hacer la interposición con lo que tengamos, como se mencionó. Uh, y uh, aprovecho esto para, para comentar que, eh, bueno, no sé, aquí en México no tenemos todavía el cemento, ¿verdad? No, o, si, o estoy equivocado, no sé si ponemos aquí ya donde estoy, ya tenemos cemento de, de disponible, ¿sí? Ah, bueno, ok, disculpe, no sabía. Entonces, por, por, uh, por Olympus. Por, ¿Qué, ¿Qué compañía tiene el cemento? El cemento para el cano circular. El Otomimix, ese lo disponen en ortopedia y, y uno lo puede solicitar, ah. es algo caro, pero, pero bueno, ahí sí, se puede disponer. También es ¿Por medio de ortopedia? Uh -huh. Ah, bueno, perfecto. Pues no, pues como utilizan ortopedistas y maxilofaciales, sí se puede pedir ahora, sí es. Es, es cara la ampolleta. Sí. ¿Cuál, 
Sí, sí, nos pone aquí el costo para que yeah, todos... The, the, the ear specific one is the exact same thing, but it's about a tenth of the amount, and so mm -hmm. it's much cheaper. Y, y bueno, y quienes han tenido posibilidad de utilizar cementos o, eh, 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 en oídos sabrán que es un problema, no, no, no es nada fácil. Eh, la gota de cemento hay que llevarla con mucha delicadeza, se pega en otros lados, etc. Eh, doctora Burkini, solo cerrando esa, esa pregunta, eh, ¿yunque autólogo o titanio en su experiencia? Yeah, so I will say the majority of patients that I do this on, I put in a prosthesis. Um, if I can get away with cement, I love to get away with cement. As you say, it's not, it does take some skill to work with the material and the, the only risk really is that you would get it on the foot plate. So you have to be very careful not to do that and fix the stapes. Um, but when it works, I mean, the audiologic results are beautiful and there's no risk of um, extrusion and you don't have to put cartilage in the tympanic membrane. Um, I would say a handful of times a year I do an incus and it usually uh, is someone who I say, I'm gonna plan on a second stage, but there's a chance they don't need it. And so I'll put the incus in there in the first stage and I'll, I'll tell them, let's get an MRI, make sure you don't have recurrence. And then if your hearing's good, we don't have to do anything. But if your hearing's not good, we can always come back at the second stage and put the prosthesis in as we would have. I'll prep their tympanic membrane as if I was planning to put a prosthesis in second stage, but plunk the incus in there um, and, and pray. <laughs> eh, doctora Burkin, algo que mencionó ahorita, con prótesis de titanio o titanio hidroxiapatita, ¿tiene alguna consideración en pacientes con colesteatoma? Eh, perdón, para hacer resonancia magnética, en algún paciente que reto, re, retiró un colesteatoma, puso una prótesis, ¿tiene alguna consideración para resonancia magnética o considera que son completamente compatibles? Um, so it's conditionally compatible and the companies um, give you a, for most of them it's up to a three Tesla magnet, so it's the majority of MRIs um, that they're compatible with. Um, but our radiologist will, they have an implant card and our radiologist will pull up um, their specific implant and see what the manufacturer's recommendations for MRI compatibility are. But I mean, we are even at this point doing MRIs on patients with cochlear implants with a magnet in their head. Um, we have a special head wrap that we put on them and we still can get the MRI if they need it. But for those patients, we don't take any special precautions for a ossicular prosthesis. We just make sure we don't put them in our strongest magnet. Perfecto, doctor. Y eh, el doctor Guillermo Hernández Valencia, digo, además de algunos comentarios que tenemos, eh, todos felicitando la plática, felicitándola a usted también, la participación de, de, de todos. Él, eh, que es un gran maestro de cirugía otológica en nuestro país, comenta que eh, cuando hay una hipoacusia que es conductiva de más de 40 decibeles, Además de la perforación, siempre debe uno de pensar en alteración de la cadena o lisis o fijación, como ya lo platicamos. Y bueno, nos comenta que él para reconstruir utiliza a veces cartílago, hueso modelado, como lo, lo platicaba el doctor Benjamín García, o fragmentos de corteza de mastoides que él también eh, llega a modelar. ¿no? Eh, entonces, eh, bueno, gracias por los comentarios también, doctor Hernán Valencia. Eh, estimado Benjamín, ¿Alguna otra cosa? Pues, no sé, pues simplemente, pues ha sido un, una plática estupenda. La verdad es que siempre que escuchamos a la doctora, cuando las clases que le ha dado a mis residentes, la verdad es que ha sido una maravilla. Y, y pues hoy no fue la excepción, la verdad es que fue excelente esta plática. Gracias a, a todos por su participación. Eh, doctora, eh, no, no creo que sea la, 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 la última vez que la veamos por aquí. Ojalá tengamos la oportunidad de hacer un congreso ya presencial porque la verdad es de que hace falta y pues bueno, esperemos que en, pronto se acabe esta pandemia y la podamos tener aquí en México como profesora, pero 
en forma personal saludarla y, y, y pues presencial. muchísimas gracias verla en presencial acá en México y, y pues le agradecemos su participación y, 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 y muchas gracias a, a todos los asistentes que fueron bastantes y, y pues bueno tenemos otra plática en febrero y ya les iremos avisando el doctor José Luis Pinto es un otorrino laringólogo que está eh, otorrino de, de es de Chile. Él nos va a hablar sobre presbi vestibulopatía. Él ha organizado un grupo que se llama Geno, Grupo de Estudio Neurotológico, que es una, una maravilla porque se dan unas pláticas increíbles también ahí y es una forma de aprender. La verdad es que la pandemia nos ha traído eh, otras formas de aprendizaje que jamás lo hubiéramos pensado, ¿no? Ahora vemos estas pláticas de Zoom y, y pues yo que no soy tan joven, pues estoy maravillado y, y pues bueno, muchas gracias a todos y pues damos por concluida esta, esta sesión. Muchas gracias a todos. Muchas gracias.